But that's it for really not that much effort. We can make these really pretty graphs and find out what genes are dynamic during these changing processes. So I'm going to very briefly go into what RNA velocity actually is. In the most general sense, it's just a measure of the unspliced displaced reads. When RNA is transcribed, it includes introns too. And these unspliced RNA fragments are still sequenced when you do RNA sequencing. And so are the mature spliced RNA. So why this is important is because we can infer time from it. Right after transcription, RNA is unspliced. Then eventually after some amount of time, the RNA becomes spliced. So let's say you have a cell and it receives some signal to upregulate some individual gene or some set of genes. If you were to look at this cell right after this signal, you should see that those genes are more in the unspliced versus a cell that has been receiving the same signal. If it reaches a steady state, there should be a higher ratio of spliced reads. So based on these levels, we can infer the velocity this cell is likely going to become this cell here. So what actually makes SCVLO unique? Of course, there's been RNA velocity tools before 2020. So what's so special about this? Well, it solves a couple issues, mainly based on assumptions past programs have made. And one of those main assumptions is that the cells with the highest unspliced to spliced reads this is just a scatter plot where these circles are cells and their expression of some individual gene. So they would assume that these cells with the highest unspliced and spliced reads were at a steady state. But what happens if your population doesn't have a steady state? Then this model can really skew your velocity predictions. And so SCVLO just basically uses some fancy algorithm so that you don't have to make the, this assumption. And here, just to reiterate, if you have a lot of unspliced reads and a low amount of spliced reads, that means a gene is likely being turned on. So these cells up here would have a high positive velocity for whatever gene we're looking at here. And then conversely, if you have a high amount of spliced reads and a low amount of unspliced reads, that means the gene is likely being turned off in these cells. And then the actual measure of RNA velocity or any given cell is basically just a measure from this center line to whatever cell. So this cell would have a really high positive velocity and this cell here would have a negative velocity for this whatever gene you're looking at. All right, so I'm actually gonna go a little more into the installation because I know a lot of you might be used to using R and not used to using Python packages. So the first thing you want to do is on whatever Linux environment you're using is you want to install Miniconda. I already have it installed, but installing it's super simple. I have another video for that in my channel you can check out. But basically you just download the Miniconda installer shell script and then you just run it. And then when you restart your terminal, you should start as base. We're going to go ahead and create a new Conda environment where we will install dependencies into. All right, after that finishes, just make sure to actually activate it. So our workflow is going to be broken up into two different pieces. First, we need to actually count the unspliced displaced reads. I see Velo doesn't do that. What we need instead is to use a program called Velocito. And you can just go over to Google or whatever and search for Velocito and you should come up with the installation guide and you see there's some dependencies. What you can do is just copy these and then just put it right into your terminal and let those install. Then we'll pip install Velocito. So their installation guide actually is missing SAM tools, so we need to install SAM tools as well. All right, so importantly, after you install SAM tools, I think they've fixed the issue now, but sometimes it didn't install through Conda correctly. So just run SAM tools and make sure you get this help file. If you don't, 
you'll need to change the channel order in your conda environment and then reinstall it. All right, so I'm going to run this on the same tutorial sample I used in my previous tutorial videos. It's a 10x sample, so Vilasito can work on other types of output, but I know a lot of you are probably just going to use 10x, so I'm just going to cover 10x. A very important point is you need the raw data, either the output from your single cell pipeline, or you need to start with the fast queues and then run the single cell pipeline, but you need the BAM file from that. In my case, if I look here, we have the tutorial sample. This is just the output from the 10x pipeline. And actually, VLICito allows you to just run it directly on this sample folder. So super simple. But we do need the GTF file from the reference you use. If you did 10x, this is going to be what you downloaded directly from the website. In my case, I downloaded it and did a little editing to the reference. So, so my reference is actually called Human Zika. But if you're using the unadulterated reference from 10x, it should just be the long name of whatever reference it is. But inside this, it'll look the same. So in here we have the genes, and then inside here we have the genes GTF file. We actually need that, and we need to unzip it. So let's just copy it to our current directory here. And we need to unzip it. It's a GZ file, so we can just run gunzip. All right, so we have our unzip GTF file. Now we can run Velocito. It's a super simple command. And then we're going to do run 10x since we did 10x. Of course, if you're not using 10x, just check out their website. They make it pretty easy to use on any type of single cell output. And then we're just going to point to the folder of our 10x output. If you don't know how to run 10x and you have raw fast queue files, I actually have another video that goes over that. But just point that output folder from that and then point to that unzip GTF file we just made. So running it like this might take a couple hours. So we're going to add some threads to this. So the dash and then the add symbol, and then I'm just going to use 14 threads. And then we need to specify how much memory we can use per thread. And I'm just going to give it 8,000. It's in megabytes, so about 8 gigs. And then we just run this, and it'll actually save the output within your 10x folder. It'll make a new folder inside that. And it'll give you a lot of output and a lot of random warnings. As long as you don't get an error where it quits, oh, like that. So like I said, I made a custom reference. I actually added Zika. Of course, Zika doesn't have an Exxon number, but I'm just going to put one in there so that this pipeline can actually run. And then I'm just going to rerun what I just showed. Uh, just to show you what I was talking about here, see, I added Zika in my GTF. And I just needed to add Exxon number one, even though it's not a Exxon. And then just run the same thing again. All right, so it took about three and a half hours or so. I actually checked while I was running to see their resource usage, and it doesn't really seem like it does a good job with multi-threading. I'm not sure adding those threads and memory options actually sped it up at all. Anyway, so the important part here is it saved the output file, this loom file, in the 10x folder under a new folder called Vilasito. And this is the file we'll open up in a little while. All right, now we're actually going to install scvlo and some other dependencies. So let's first install Jupyter Notebook. So pip install notebook. Then let's install scanp. This is just the Python equivalent to Surat. And then let's install scvlo. And then finally, we'll have to install the laden algorithm for when we do our clustering. That's all we need. So now we can actually launch a Jupyter Notebook. And that should pop up in your default browser. And then let's just create a new Python 3 kernel. And then for this tutorial, we're just going to import a couple packages. 
And then I'm going to do my pre-processing using ScanP. You could have done it in Surat and open it up later. Or SCVLO actually has a basic built-in normalization and pre-processing function. And in this way, we'll be able to set clusters and labels. And since the point of this video is not to go over ScanP pre-processing, I'm not going to go into this. Um, again, I have another video that does if you're interested, but I'm just doing a pretty basic pre-processing. So I'll use this function to open up and pre-process the RNA data from our 10x output. I'll just let that run for a minute. One thing I wanted to point out is that this pre-processing does only leave the highly variable genes. So you can change this to actually include all the genes, or you can do the clustering and labeling beforehand, and then just transfer the labels to an unnormalized object, and then do the SCVLO default normalization. Um, it just might change the results slightly, so that's something with your data set if you want to play around with. Maybe don't just use my default pre-processing verbatim. And after that's done, we can open up that Loom file created by Vila Saito. And then we just want to merge these two together. So now we have our A-data object that's normalized with RNA, and it's merged with the unspliced and spliced read data. The splice data still needs to be normalized, so we'll do that now. See, and since we already pre-processed with ScanP, this is what you want to see. X is just the gene expression data, so it doesn't normalize that, but it normalized the spliced and unspliced count data. Right, then we just need to calculate the moments. And then we can calculate the actual velocity. And for that, we're just going to do the default values here. So the default actually just does a stochastic method. It's not that fancy method I was talking about earlier that SCVLO is known for. I'll show the other in just a minute. And then we'll compute the velocity graph. All right, so now we actually have all the velocity calculated, at least for this basic stochastic method. So we can actually visualize that a couple different ways. And now I'm going to point out that my data set really isn't tailored for RNA velocity. So I'm not really sure what the results are going to look like. But if we want to plot each individual cell as one velocity arrow, we can do that like this. Actually, we can change the parameters of the image first using these SCVLO default settings here if we set figure params. And then let me show you what's actually happening here. So if we look at A data, we see that when we did the pre-processing, we called the cluster labels. So that's why I'm passing color equals laden. Laden is just the column name. So when we run this, Sorry, I actually ran the wrong one. I wanted to do velocity embeddings. All right, so we see a bunch of little tiny arrows. Um, this usually isn't the best way to look at it. Let's try plotting it on a grid instead of an arrow for each individual cell. So it's going to be pretty much the same thing, except embedding grid. Now you can see the trends a little bit better. So like in this peak here, we seem to have some bigger arrows pointing in this direction. But by far, my favorite one is the velocity embedding stream. So if we turn this into stream instead of grid, we get this really pretty looking figure here. But again, this isn't really the best data set suited for RNA velocity. I was a little bit interested to see if maybe there was some velocity associated with infection, which from my past analyses, I know cluster four here is the heavily infected cluster. And it does seem like there's some velocity in this direction, 
but overall really RNA velocity is better suited for data sets like development where there's a very drastic change in cell state or a continuous change in cell state. So of course these UMAPs are really pretty, but you know, you shouldn't make any big sweeping conclusions just from looking at the arrows. Instead, we can actually look at individual genes or the top genes from individual clusters, etc. I'm not going to go into every little function because then this would turn into an hour long video. The SC Vila Read the Docs has a pretty good rundown of the most basic analyses. I'll just show you a couple important ones. For example, if you want to look at an individual gene, we can do that. Here I'm just picking two genes and we can see this is similar to that graph I showed earlier. So if the cell has a high unspliced RNA count versus a low spliced RNA count, we know that it's being turned on or has high positive velocity. And as you see here, a lot of these cells have positive velocity because they're above this line. And we see that here in green and you can also look at the overlaid expression of those genes as well. Let's say we wanted to know the genes in each cluster with the highest velocity. So we can do that pretty easily too. Again, we're breaking these up by the Leyden cluster label and we're just setting a threshold. I think this might be the default threshold. I'm gonna spell that correctly. Okay, so this just adds onto the a data object, but we can convert that into a data frame. And here we see the genes with the top velocity for each of the clusters. Another important function is the velocity confidence. All right, so this actually adds to the observation data frame in A data. So if we look at that, you see now we have velocity confidence and velocity length, and we can plot that for each individual cell. So velocity length is pretty intuitive. It just means these cells have a higher velocity. And then velocity confidence is actually kind of a measure of the directionality of neighboring cells. So if a bunch of cells close together are pointed in completely opposite directions, it's going to have a lower velocity confidence than a bunch of cells which have a similar direction to their velocity. And then finally, I'm going to show some pseudo time functions. I don't know how it's going to work with these data, but let's just try it. We're calling the velocity pseudo time function, and let's just plot this too. Actually, this is pretty interesting. These are the most heavily infected cells. They have the most Zika UMIs in them. I just know that from past analysis. Interestingly, we see that they got labeled as zero pseudotime, which of course is wrong. Um, I think it's just because my data isn't suited for a velocity analysis. Um, but interestingly, if, if you were to switch these, if these were one and, and the rest were zero, they would actually make a lot of sense. So it seems like there's something going on here. I'm going to have to look into it a little more. Maybe at the end of this video, I'll show what it's supposed to look like in a developmental data set because SEVLO actually has one that you can load. But let me just show you quickly how to run the dynamic model that SEVLO is famous for. All right, so before we can do the velocity calculation this time, we have to do a recover dynamics. And this actually takes a while. So we need to specify number of threads. I'm just setting it to 20. It'll take maybe like 15 minutes if you do one thread. 
instead of leaving the default stochastic method, we're calling dynamical method here. So this will just recalculate and give us new values for velocity. And then this is the same as earlier and graphing it will be the same as earlier. Yeah, so with 20 threads, it took about 28 seconds. And we can see visually this is a little different than what we saw earlier. Again, this is supposed to be the better method. But after doing this method, we can actually do some neat functions such as latent time. You have to spell things correctly. Anyways, our time's kind of dispersed. Um, we kind of see what we saw earlier with this being actually now it seems to be labeled as one instead of an earlier time point. Anyway, let me just show you really quickly. I'm just going to redo a couple of these functions using an actual developmental data set so you know ideally how they would look like instead of using my not really suitable data set for RNA velocity. So SC Velo actually has a, let's just call it test, so we don't overwrite our A data from earlier. But you can load SCV data sets, and then we'll load the pancreas developmental one. And this is just, an, it's an A data object, and it has, it's pretty much where we had the merging, but there's no pre-processing yet. Um, but unlike our data, it already has labels, so... We don't really need to do pre-processing. So if we use the stochastic model, which is the default, so the same thing as not having this there, and then we plot it, um, instead of using laden, they have their clusters labeled as clusters. See if we look at test.obs, that instead of laden, they just have clusters. And instead of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, they actually have real names for their clusters. But now we have this nice velocity along this actual developmental trajectory. Let's just copy and paste some of these things we did earlier. So let's look at the pseudo time. Oh, got to change this to test. And here, this is exactly what you would expect with this developmental time course starting at zero and then going all the way down this developmental trajectory. And then let's try that latent time one using the dynamical model. That took a little longer and I left latent in here on accident. So let's just ignore that error and put this down here. And like I said, they had changed their label. What did they change it to? Clusters. So let's just put clusters here. So this is based on their dynamical model. It looks decently similar to what we saw on the stochastic model. But now let's try doing latent time. And we have this really neat looking plot here, which is similar to pseudo time. But that's it for really not that much effort. We can make these really pretty graphs and find out what genes are dynamic during these changing processes.